Welcome back. So in the last video, what we covered was uh, the continuous time version of stability analysis, which is what we're using to try to determine uh, for a discrete time, for a, a population model or other any other dynamic model. These aren't strictly limited to population models. For any dynamic model, uh, is an equilibrium going to be stable or unstable? Are we sitting on top of a hill? Or are we in the in the valley in terms of this metaphor of balls rolling uh, off hills and into valleys? Uh, so let's gonna now think about that from a continuous time perspective. Um, are our equilibrium stable or not? So let's think about our generic continuous time model, which is DNDT, some change in population with time, is some function of n, the current population. We're going to again assume that we've already solved for the equilibrium n hat. And we're going to again think about this in terms of some perturbation. We want to measure, we have some epsilon at time t, which is the difference between the population and its equilibrium, whichever equilibrium we're looking at. And we're going to assume that these perturbations are relatively small. Um, so as before, we're going to approximate this uh, using a derivative. So we're going to say that the um, change in epsilon with t, the d epsilon dt, if we just take the derivative of that, is going to end up, you know, so one way to think about this is we're taking the derivative of this function up here uh, with respect to n, uh, sorry, we're taking the derivative of this with respect to t, remembering that the equilibrium doesn't change, uh, which is why it ends up being related to the function. Um, cool. Um, so we want to know the slope of this, df dn, slope of the function. Uh, times the perturbation and this little r and directly analogous to the lambda in the previous version. Okay, so in this case, the criteria for continuous time are, are simpler. Um, if this r is less than zero, it's stable. And there's uh, not an equivalent tendency to get oscillatory behavior uh, with uh, with continuous time models, not to say the continuous time models can't produce oscillations, but you know this idea of a response to a small perturbation uh, where we're approximating this, it doesn't give us that kind of oscillatory response because we don't have this sign flipping sort of thing. Cool. Okay, so if we think about this graphically, it's again much simpler. If uh, if this r is positive, then our displacement is going to grow with time, and if this r is negative, then our displacement is going to shrink with time, because again we're writing this. I'm going to just come back and rem remind us that you know. Unlike in discrete time, uh, where we're looking at the discrete size of a perturbation from time point to time point, we're thinking about this in terms of a derivative uh, with respect to time, a rate at which this perturbation is changing. And if this rate, uh, if the perturbation is, if this rate constant is negative, it's declining. If this rate constant is positive, it's increasing for the same reasons that we had when we wrote down. Uh, DNDT for exponential growth, when that growth rate was positive, it was increasing. When that growth rate was negative, it was decreasing. So again, very analogous, but now instead of talking about the growth rate of the population as a whole, we're talking about the growth or, uh, rate of the size of this perturbation uh, around the any particular equilibrium. And remember that we would have to evaluate each of these equilibriums for these criteria. So if we have a model that has three equilibriums, we have to check three different n hats to understand which are stable and which are unstable. Uh, in terms of the graphical analysis, 
uh, actually find the graphical analysis of the continuous time model to be uh, a little bit more intuitive for most people because uh, this DPDT, again, it's analogous to what we've been talking about is DNDT, uh, the change in population with the change in time, when that is zero, that's an equilibrium. And again, that's what we were doing to solve for equilibrium. So any point that this curve in this model is just whatever equation we write down that describes uh, how DNDT changes with N or DPDT changes with P. Um, whenever that's equal to zero, that's an equilibrium because that defines a place where the growth is zero. And again, uh, we wanna see if that's increasing or decreasing. So in this range between zero in this middle equilibrium, uh, DNDT is negative. So the growth rate is negative. So that's declining. And when between this point and that point, we're above that zero line. So this growth rate is positive. So it's increasing. So again, uh, here, growth rate is positive increasing, it's negative decreasing, it's positive increasing, it's negative decreasing, and so this is this a tendency at this upper equilibrium to converge to it being stable. Uh, this middle equilibrium, there's a tendency to diverge away from it, it's unstable, and this lower equilibrium, there's a tendency to converge back to zero, it is stable. Uh, and again, we can look at this in terms of the slope of the line, which actually tells us exactly uh, what that, um, it tells us exactly about the stabil stability. The slope is positive, which corresponds to um, a, uh, a unstable equilibrium in the sense that any perturbation away from that with the slope being positive is going to grow. Uh, and then here, the slope is negative, so any perturbation oh, away from that is going to shrink. And again, this one is slope is negative, any perturbation is going to shrink. Um, cool. So having talked about these uh, criteria for stability in the abstract, uh, what I want to do next is to apply them to um, the logistic growth model. Uh, to make it easier to do derivatives, I've expanded out the n here. So instead of being r times n, 1 minus n over k, I've just multiplied that out to be rn minus r n squared over k, just moving things out of the parentheses. So in continuous time, uh, we had already saw that our two options for equilibrium are going to be um, zero and k. Um, now we want to take the derivative of this growth model uh, with respect to n. And then we want to be able to, so that gives us this r minus 2r k over n, n hat over k. And that's just because uh, derivative of r times n with respect to n is just r derivative here and uh, r over k is just a constant. Uh, the root of n squared is 2n, so that's where we get this 2n. OK, so next, we need to plug in the, the options for the equilibrium. And remember, there are those two equilibria, so there's going to be two cases. Uh, when this slope, we want to know this slope when uh, we're at the lower equilibrium of 0, and we want to know this slope at the upper equilibrium of k. So if we plug in zero here, um, this whole term goes away and we just have df dn equals r. And remember r is, is now, uh, yeah, r. We actually don't know the sign of r yet because we have it. This is a solution irrespective of the actual magnitude of r. Um, and then on the other end, if we plug in the other equilibrium k, k over k is one, and so we just get r minus 2r and we get minus r. So now that gives us, we want to know when is this equilibrium unstable and when is this stable? So anytime r is bigger than zero, uh, this equilibrium is going to be unstable uh, because it's going to make this 
yeah, when R is bigger than zero, then R is bigger than zero. Uh, you know, this is unstable. Uh, and when R is less than zero, this is unstable. So if our overall population growth rate is positive, uh, then the e equilibrium at zero is unstable. And that's gonna be our most common case, uh, which makes sense if, if uh, the population growth rate is zero, is positive, then any perturbation away from extinction will tend to increase uh, towards the carrying capacity. If the population growth rate is negative, then you're going to go uh, to extinction. Uh, by contrast, uh, if the population growth rate, uh, if we were looking at this carrying capacity, uh, the carrying capacity is going to be unstable if the population growth rate is negative which makes sense. If you're at the carrying capacity, but the population growth rate is uh, negative, you know, you per get per perturbed away from it, you're going to go extinct. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that equilibrium is stable when R is positive. Cool. We can go back again as well to the discrete time version of this model and ask about the stability of the logistic model. So again, we had solved for that in the generic case. We had f of n as n plus rn uh, minus rn squared k. So uh, remember that was uh, originally n of t equals uh, n at t plus one equals n of at t equals this plus this growth term. Uh, we take the derivative of that whole thing. The derivative of n is one, the derivative of r times n is r. And again, the derivative of r n squared k is just two r n k. And then we wanna ask, uh, we wanna evaluate this at our two equilibrium. So when uh, n equals zero is one equilibrium and when k e uh, n equals k is the other equilibrium, and now we have uh, four options. Uh, so first, if we're looking at the equilibrium at zero, uh, that, uh, that equilibrium at zero is gonna be unstable, uh, but non-oscillatory when the population growth rate is positive. Again, kind of makes sense. Uh, it's going to be uh, stable, but non-oscillatory when the population growth rate is uh, negative, but uh, not less than negative one. Uh, it's gonna be stable and oscillatory when it's really small and unstable and oscillatory when it's even smaller. Now let's say, oh, we'll say in practical purposes, uh, these last two criteria don't really matter because you know, it, you can't really oscillate around uh, <laughs> an extinction. Like uh, mathematically, it's possible to write an equation that says you'd go from like a little bit above zero to a little bit of below zero, but a population size is a little bit below zero. Maybe a mathematically useful fiction, but it doesn't actually make any sense. So basically it boils down to uh, if a population is growth rate is positive, then that extinction is unstable if the population growth rate is negative, um, then you're gonna go to extinction. Uh, things are more interesting though for the, the other equilibrium and that's is gonna kind of mimic what we found in our graphical analysis. Uh, so if the population growth rate is negative, uh, carrying capacity is an unstable equilibrium. You are going, if population growth rate is negative, you're gonna to decline to extinction. Uh, if the population growth rate is, uh, this little r is between zero and one, uh, we're stable and non-oscillatory. So we're gonna to converge to uh, our carrying capacity smoothly. If it's between one and two, we're gonna converge to our uh, carrying capacity um, in an oscillatory way. And if the growth rate is, is bigger, 
we're going to be unstable and oscillatory. So that's when we're getting into that range of uh, persistent oscillations uh, and eventually chaos. So that corresponds exactly to what we kind of uh, saw by simulation as well. Cool. And so this, this was applied in this case to the discrete time model, but it's the sort of thing that we would want to at least conceptually understand how to do in uh, both discrete and continuous time models graphically and mathematically. I'll reiterate what I said at the lot in the last video, being able to do this graphically is far more important uh, and uh, being able to do this analytically is something that's important to know exists and know how to look up and understand uh, when you need to apply it. But much more important is, is the general understanding of the principles that equilibria, uh, that we, that there is this concept of stability, uh, that, that there's this concept of, of damped oscillations and that, they're, that you need to be aware of, particularly in discrete time. Um, and that, that if all we're interested in is the equilibrium and their stability, not the transient behaviors in between, which for many populations we do care about, but if we're really equal, interested in these equilibria, that the shape of the model is not nearly as important as where it crosses these uh, cases that determine stability and the slope at that crossing. Thanks, and uh, that kind of wraps up our discussion of equilibrium and stability.